Welcome to the panel on Can America Have a Coherent Foreign Policy? Uh, and the uh, follow-up language to that, which was not included, is given the chaotic structure of American politics today. So we have here to explain the answers to all the above a brilliant panel consisting of Grover Norquist, who is the tax reform person. Uh, Grover Norquist is on the board of, he's a native of Massachusetts. He, uh, Norquist is Tom Paine crossed with Lee Atwater, plus just a soupçon of Madame Defarge. And Ariana Huffington, I'm sure a favorite of everybody in this room, says, that Norquist is the dark wizard of the right's anti-tax cult, cult. I've got a whole page of quotes about Grover, but you probably already know Grover Norquist very well, and we're glad, Norval, Grover, to have you here with us. Robert Mary is well known to Washingtonians. He's, for years and years, been a major figure in Washington journalism. He uh, is, at the present time, the publisher of Strategic Forecasts in Austin. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, my wife is a stockholder, and she brought home a bumper sticker the other day that said, Keep Austin Weird. He lives down in Austin. That's the headquarters of Stratford. So I asked him last night, what does that mean? Oh, he says, Austin is weird and we love it. <laughs> Bob, Bob Mary is well known, I'm sure, to all of you, and Jim Hoagland even better to all of you because he is a weekly columnist for the Washington Post writing on foreign affairs. His column appears on Sundays. He is a major figure in uh, journalism all around the world. In 2002, the editors of the Times of London, Le Figaro, De Welt, and four other leading European newspapers headed a jury that awarded the Hoagland the Chernobyl Europa Prize. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1971 for international reporting and in 1991 for commentary. So that's our splendid panel and we're very from what else you're doing to be here on this panel. Can America have a coherent foreign policy? Let me just remind you all it's in American foreign policy that go to the question of can we have a, a coherent foreign policy. First incident I want to mention is the War of 1812. Uh, Andrew Jackson decided that he knew what American foreign policy should be. I mean, the British were here trying to reverse the results of the Revolutionary War. And the Washington establishment was not apparently up to quite up to dealing with the problem. But Andrew Jackson from Tennessee decided that he knew exactly what to do, which he did. And he went down from Tennessee to New Orleans, and you know the rest. The rest is history. Several decades later, President Truman was confronted with a request from the British to take over the defense of Greece against communism. And uh, he didn't know quite what he could do about that because there was no interest or support in the American public or in this or anywhere else in Congress. So he went up to consult with Senator Vandenberg, an isolationist Republican, and said, what can we do? And Vandenberg said, look, he said, you can get assistance for Greece from the Congress, but you have to scare the daylights out of the American people, which he did. And of course, the rest is history. That was the origin of NATO. Nixon himself <laughs> did something in, in foreign policy that nobody understood at the time. And many people still don't understand it and are opposed to what he did by opening up to China, but he knew exactly what he was doing, opening up the game, so to speak, between the United States and Russia and China by opening the door to China, opening the world to China, opening China to the world. Very coherent 
if, and, and that's the word that comes to mind, a very coherent foreign policy for the United States. A more recent example of how difficult it is to have a coherent policy for the United States, foreign policy, is from what Dick Cheney told the American Legion Convention in the fall of 2002, seven months before the invasion of Iraq. Cheney told the American Legion, and I'm quoting, quote, simply stated, there is no doubt that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, unquote. Well, it's not easy to have a coherent foreign policy for the United States. So that's what we're going to discuss this morning, and I'd like to ask Grover Norquist to uh, open the discussion, if you will, Gordon Grover, please. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I looked up coherent. It means logically ordered and integrated. It does not mean sensible or correct, um, or necessarily one that works. But it's possible, but not necessary, to have a coherent foreign policy uh, in the United States. One of our challenges, and what either puts limitations on what a Republican or Democrat president uh, can do are the structure of the two political parties. And for the most part, there, there isn't a part of the electorate that, that demands a coherent, uh, integrated, uh, sensible uh, foreign policy, which you have on the, the center right, the Republican side around the table, are people saying, don't raise my taxes, don't steal my guns, leave my kids and my faith alone, um, and uh, don't regulate my businesses. And, but there's no group there that has uh, the ability, uh, there's no National Rifle Association for an um, integrated foreign policy position or strong national defense. Uh, even groups that we sometimes think of as, uh, well, maybe that's the defense lobby, the veterans groups are actually uh, a lobby for veterans' benefits, not for uh, a, a coherent nuclear strategy. Uh, or even a robust budget for weapon systems or paying existing soldiers. Uh, so around the Republican table, all the interest groups that you have to have if you're going to run for Congress or Senator, President, or Republican, they've all got things that they want you to do or, more importantly, in the case of Republicans, not do. Uh, but foreign policy isn't on that list, and therefore a Republican president has a tremendous uh, freedom uh, Bush could have reacted to September uh, 11th any number of ways. There, if he decided not to invade Iraq, there would have been 15 people who whined about it, but there would have been no um, revolt from the Republicans in the House or the Senate or the electorate. So he wasn't required by politics to make the decisions he made. He could have gone a different way. Around the Democrat table, you have the trial lawyers and the, and the labor unions and the big city political machines. Again, there's not a piece of that that requires a particular um, foreign policy. Now, you might have thought, well, what about the, the, the peace movement, the anti-war movement? There was a lot of noise about that. People were unhappy with Bush and the protracted uh, conflict, occupation in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, surely that's a piece of the modern Democratic Party's political coalition, and they have certain demands on their president, their Congress, or their Senate, although We've seen since Obama got elected, campaigning to end the war in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, that he's continued either Bush's policies or expanded them in Afghanistan with no revolt um, from the Democratic base. Um, so there aren't, there is no National Rifle Association for foreign policy or defense. There's no AFL-CIO for foreign policy or defense. A part of the governing coalitions of the Republican or Democratic Party, which put constraints on what you could do. Now, there are four exceptions, but they're regional. Um, there, there's a lobby that's concerned. Armenian Americans have strong feelings and will actually vote on certain issues, particularly if they can annoy Turkey. Greek Americans uh, have a, a similar uh, interest regionally, and again, also at Turkey's expense. Um, there's an Israel lobby that focuses on Israel, uh, and there's a Cuban-American lobby that, that's concerned about uh, not being nice to Castro. But outside of the, those four zones, and those four lobbies or domestic uh, voting blocks, interest groups, have effect on both parties. Um, they don't own one party or the other, but they all, they all affect how each of the parties go. Outside of those zones, a Republican or Democrat president has a tremendous amount of, of, of leeway uh, in, in what they do. Uh, I would give as an example the election we had 
uh, just yesterday in Kentucky where Rand Paul ran with a foreign policy quite at odds uh, with what a lot of people had, might have assumed was the Republican uh, foreign policy on Guantanamo and, and Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and, and foreign interventionism versus non-interventionism. And he won a landslide uh, running with a very different message because his message to the domestic constituencies of the modern Republican Party was a compelling one. And people either agreed with his foreign policy or it didn't move their votes. You saw Cheney actually come in and announce that this was a referendum on uh, President Cheney's leadership over the previous eight years. Uh, well, if it was, he lost that fight. So within the Republican Party, I just give that as an example that there's a tremendous leeway on where you go on foreign policy as long as you satisfy the building blocks of the domestic political structures of, of the Republican Party, which for those of us who would like to have a more coherent uh, uh, foreign policy and defense posture, it means there's an op there, the, the, both parties are open to this conversation. Uh, they're not shut down to it, but we can't force them into making wise decisions the way certain political lobbies, like the trial lawyers, could bring a senator and say, this is what you will do, uh, and, and they have to respond to it. Um, where there is not freedom, uh, that on the Democratic side, for instance, the labor unions, the power of the labor unions, take free trade off the table. That, this is a rather recent um, uh, phenomenon at, at the beginning of the Clinton administration. That was not true ever since Monica Lewinsky. It was true. Uh, and so the Democratic, the, if you were trying to exercise soft power by having a more free trade regime, by having more international investment and more Americans living abroad, the Democrats and, and the tr labor unions are committed to a tax policy and a tariff and restriction of trade policy that makes that difficult to impossible. Uh, one of the advantages the United States has traditionally is uh, immigration. We can, we can bring immigrants from all over the world here in a way that other countries can't. They're an asset to us, but again, organized labor has been hostile to allowing us to have a more aggressive, and had a veto on allowing us to have a more aggressive immigration policy where we could take all the smart people in the world uh, and bring them here with uh, H-1B visas uh, to strengthen the United States or to target and annoy countries that are mean to us if we had an argument with uh, Sweden and offered to give uh, green cards to all their uh, brain surgeons and heart doctors, you could have, I mean, that's soft power and over time you could have some influence on, on how they behave. Um, Saudi Arabia can't do that. Other countries can't say, if you don't do what I like, I'll let your people move to my country. Uh, but that kind of use of soft power is precluded right because of organized labor's power within the modern democratic uh, structure. So I, I would add two thoughts that make it difficult to have a serious grown-up foreign policy. The first is bec people wonder, how come everybody always uses the Hitler and the Nazi um, illusions, everything's uh, Munich, everything's Nazi Germany, everything's black and white. The reason is we all went to public high school and that's the only mutually agreed on point of reference. Um, I tend to think the decision to, to invade and occupy Iraq is a lot more like Napoleon's decision to invade Spain in 1808, convinced that the Enlightenment was going to be welcomed in, in Spain and this would be a wonderful success on his part. But if you try and have that conversation, you don't get very far. Uh, so it's back to Hitler and Munich. And when, you, when everything has to go into that box for purposes of communication, it, it kind of makes everything black and white and difficult to have a serious grown-up conversation because not everything is Munich and not every bad person in the world is Hitler. Um, and then the last one is because the two parties have been so evenly balanced, and even though the Democrats have outperformed in the House and Senate over the last two election cycles, when you're looking at who you're planning to vote for, Republican or Democrat, how are you registered Republican? We're, we're looking at a pretty evenly balanced country. Both countries take, the, the, both parties take the other party's foreign policy efforts at foreign policy decisions and use them to score domestic points. So if somebody wanted to work and have a rational discussion with a flawed foreign country, um, they could be attacked for, oh, don't you care about women's rights? Don't you care about freedom of speech? Because in that country that you want to have a foreign policy relationship with, they are flawed in X number of ways. And so uh, 
one party or the other will take advantage of an initiative by the other's leadership and play domestic politics with that decision. And it makes it tougher to have a realistic foreign policy if people can score those kind of points. So one, presidents have a great deal of leeway because most of the, the people who brought them to politics didn't give them any constraints on how they do foreign policy, but there are some constraints, particularly by organized labor, on our soft power options. Thank you very much, Grover. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Now, Bob Mary, would you like to take it from there for 10 or 12 minutes? I will. I will. Um, I have to say that it occurs to me that the um, title for this proceeding this morning, which ends in a question mark, contains the seeds of its own answer, doesn't it? Because um, it, you wouldn't even pose the question if there was a supposition that we either do or can uh, clearly have a coherent uh, foreign policy. Otherwise, why ask the question? And the way I put it really is how I would answer that question is that there are today impediments to coherence in American foreign policy making that perhaps did not exist in a previous in previous eras. So what I'd like to do is uh, draw four distinctions between um, uh, our country today and our country back at the beginning of the Cold War when we did in fact have, as Bob was uh, alluding to, uh, what uh, most people consider to have been a coherent foreign policy. We had a simple, powerful aim, which was to check the spread of global communism. It informed just about everything we did during that long uh, struggle, uh, ideological struggle. Now, it should be said that that can be distortive uh, because there's a tendency um, during such times to view everything that happens in the world through the Cold War prism and not everything really uh, was uh, a part of the Cold War. And it could lead and did um, us into um, things that uh, many people would consider and did consider to have been misadventures, uh, most notably, of course, Vietnam. But the foreign policy was clear, it was consistent, it was cold-eyed, and it was uh, coherent. So what's different today from then? And I'm going to list four things, and they're all kind of interlocking. Uh, one is the complete collapse of the old foreign policy elite that created the post-war world, the so-called WASP establishment, the Anglo-Saxon elite. For most of our history, this elite directed and dominated most of the major institutions of our country, the big financial institutions, most of the media organizations, certainly the big corporations, Wall Street, and uh, indubitably foreign policy. By the end of World War II, uh, this elite had lost much of its sway in many of those areas, but not uh, in foreign policy. And back in 1996, I, I wrote a book, had a book come out called uh, taking on the World, which was a biography of Joseph and Stewart also, the uh, famous and very, very influential columnist, uh, largely from the uh, post-war period. And I tried to use these two guys as a kind of a vehicle to explore and illuminate American politics from 1935 to 1975, American foreign policy during that period, the Washington social scene, which was kind of a fun part of the whole project, um, and also the decline of this, um, this elite. Because these guys who came out of that milieu uh, were the journalistic cheerleaders of the uh, uh, people, uh, the WASP foreign policy elite that essentially created the post-war world. And Stuart Alsop once wrote, he, he, he wrote about this uh, in a column uh, in a response to uh, a Peter Schrag article in Harper's Magazine in the early 70s called The Decline of the Wasp, and later in his last book, State of Execution. And he said the last great accomplishment of this elite was the uh, construction of the American century to supplant Pax Britannica, which had prevailed for, of course, nearly 200 years. And he ticked off the usual list of people that we tend to think of as the wise men, so-called, uh, from the Evan Thomas Walter Isaacson book, uh, who also happened to be close family friends of the Alsops. Men like Atchison, Harriman, Forstall, Lovett, Boland, Kennan, Nitze. And Stewart suggested that this elite was a long time of dying, and he said there were a lot of developments that had occurred in American society and politics that had contributed to this, including the Great Depression, 
uh, in which a lot of these people um, lost uh, the, the standing with the American people, uh, largely uh, for having, uh, in many people's minds, l uh, led us into that uh, uh, financial economic fiasco. He believed that McCarthyism was a populist assault, essentially, on this elite. He thought that Suez uh, had a, was dealt a very significant blow to the elite because it was essentially Anglo, it was, dr it was driven by its Anglophilia and that uh, episode in which the uh, United States and, and, um, and the Brits found, found ourselves on opposite sides uh, had an impact. And then, of course, Vietnam. And I added in exploring this in my epilogue uh, another factor, uh, which was another big change since the Cold War, and this will be my second distinction, and that is essentially demographics. Um, I noted that American politics reflects not just the election returns, but the census returns. And what we were seeing at, at that time, and had been, was the ethnic, ethnic transformation um, of the United States. I wrote that America was becoming less and less an Anglo-Saxon country and less and less did it look to its old elite for guidance and governance. A very natural turn of events. New impulses, attitudes, and agendas were emerging with expanding and more diverse waves of immigration. Um, and this second factor had sort of generated two other interlocking results. Um, which I think were also distinctions in terms of that period and our period today. And one is, and, and as I say, they're, they're all interrelated. Uh, one is the expansion, and uh, Grover alluded to this somewhat, uh, of uh, what we might call diaspora politics uh, in America today that affects a lot of our politics, but it does affect uh, foreign policy making. Samuel Huntington, who might consider to be the greatest political scientist of his generation, other people disagree with that, uh, wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs which I thought was quite penetrating in I think 1996, in which he noted, he wrote about this and a lot of implications of it, that diasporas in the United States had had major impact on American foreign policy toward, and he ticked off these examples. Greece and Turkey, the Caucasus, recognition of Macedonia, uh, Grover mentioned those, support for Croatia, sanctions against South Africa, aid for black Africa, intervention in Haiti, NATO expansion, sanctions against Cuba, controversy in Northern Ireland, and relations between Israel and its neighbors. Uh, sometimes these diaspora interests coincide with uh, America's nation national interests, but I think it would be folly and foolish uh, to think that they, that they always will, or perhaps even that they most often will. So um, uh, that is um, a, 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 sig a significant distinction as well. And finally, and again, interrelated as I say, is what I'm going to call uh, the trend toward denationalization of America. When you have an increase in particularism, which I've just been describing, it's inevitable that you're going to have a decrease in nationalism in the, in the, in the um, um, impulse and, and sentiment of nationalism within the national consciousness. And I'll use just one example for purposes of this 10 minutes, and that is the rise of dual citizenship. Now, the oath of citizenship that the people take when they are uh, become citizens uh, under our, nat our naturalization laws, um, uh, that oath was written uh, at the very beginning of our republic, and it has not been changed. There have been some efforts. Uh, uh, to change it, but uh, that those efforts can never uh, work if they are really brought to uh, actual dialogue within the United States or the Congress, etc. And the person swears, I do solemnly swear, and then they swear to a number of things, and the second one is, quote, to renounce and abjure absolutely and entirely all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which the applicant was before a subject or citizen. Now that makes it very clear there is no dual citizenship in the concept of naturalization, naturalized citizenship in the United States. It was what was called the exclusivity principle and it prevailed for decades throughout our history. Uh, now there are growing numbers of Americans with dual citizenship. Uh, it's very difficult to determine how many. I think that you could say, I think you could make a case that it probably reaches in the neighborhood of eight million. Uh, and um, 
Huntington referred to this as the devaluation of American citizenship. Uh, and it's been obviously promoted by many of the so-called sending countries because it's obviously in their interest, uh, and not just with regard to remittances, but also with regard to the uh, influence, political influence, and we brought to bear uh, on decisions, national decisions that affect uh, those countries. Uh, now, this is a huge change. It's been fostered pretty much in an implicit subterranean manner, largely by judges and bureaucrats, but the Congress has abetted it uh, largely implicitly, not entirely. But efforts, as I say, to soften or to loosen the naturalization oath are always shot down, and I would venture to say, I used to be a political reporter for the Wall Street Journal for a lot of years in this town, uh, and uh, my political judgment would be that uh, no effort, if it actually led to an open debate, uh, would, sigh, would, would survive that political battle. So those are four main significant distinctions to be drawn between the last period of a sustained coherence in foreign policy and today. Do these uh, changes and these developments and these trends uh, preclude the possibility of a foreign policy that has more coherence than we're seeing today? I don't think so. I think it may be that it's going to take a, a significantly greater crisis facing the United States before they would be um, uh, damped down to the extent where we could uh, have uh, uh, that kind of coherence. Um, but by way of illustration, and I, I, I know that uh, people sometimes think that I suck up to uh, my elders in this town whom I respect a great deal, but uh, back in 1996 I came across a quote from Dr. James Schlesinger in which he said that the U.S. has, quote, less of a foreign policy in the traditional sense of a great power than we have the stapling together of a series of goals put forth by domestic constituency groups. The result is that American foreign policy is incoherent, and uh, I would agree with that. Thank you. There you have it. Thanks, Bob Mary. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim Hoagland, would you like to wrap it up? I'll, I'll give it a try. I'll try to wrestle this steer to the ground. But uh, as Bob Perry just noted, uh, Jim Schlesinger got there before us, <laughs> as he always does. Um, like Bob and Grover, I uh, was really struck by this challenging title, can the U.S. have a coherent foreign policy, rather than does the U.S. or should the U.S., which you can argue about. But it's, it's a great title um, in part because I think it's a question that would certainly engage President Obama. If you go through descriptions of how he makes decisions on foreign policy uh, and you look at some of those decisions, you can see that he values coherence to a great extent, trying to reconcile a lot of opposing factors. Take his decision on Afghanistan. Uh, I think that's a primary example of where he would say that that was a very coherent foreign policy decision. Um, uh, because he did in the campaign uh, promise to pursue the Afghanistan war more vigorously, not to wind it down. Um, the question uh, really demands a direct answer, and my answer, of course, is yes, if. And I have three points to make. The, the things that need to be done in order to uh, guide us toward at least a more coherent foreign policy in a very challenging time when we no longer have the example of uh, or the uh, enemy uh, in one single form that uh, enable us to uh, adopt containment as a single answer to the world's problems. Um, and the three yes-ifs that I have start um, with the need to seek a political center to support a bipartisan consensus on foreign policy. Grover has described, uh, if, I, if I read it right, uh, a situation in which uh, a lack of coherence uh, on foreign policy is no big deal. Uh, that the political party structures, and here I do agree with him, uh, are great inhibitions to that today. And I think his analysis of why that's true is, is uh, very valuable. But I would point out that the Republicans, as a political party, have lost the advantage that they had in previous presidential elections of being the party identified by the public as having a certain advantage on directing foreign policy. Um, I'm not sure that's a good thing for the Republican Party. I think if I were a Republican, I'd want to think about that. It's not to say that I'm not a Republican or I am a Republican, but I'm saying 
that uh, there are politi domestic political gains from having the appearance, at least, of a coherent foreign policy. Now, how, how do we go about constructing uh, the uh, bipartisan consensus and moving away from the political polarization uh, of today, which both reflects and contributes to the confused national sense of purpose and priorities abroad that our title suggests today. George Schultz uh, and people at Hoover are working on an initiative to have more states, all states if possible, adopt the open primary system uh, in which the candidates would be compelled, in each party, would be compelled to seek centrist votes in order to win in their own primary. An open primary, of course, is that everybody votes for whichever candidate he or she wants, uh, and it's not restricted to only Republicans or only Democrats. Uh, I think that's a promising uh, idea that will be pursued. Uh, secondly, we also need a movement that recognizes what the public knows and what it thinks it knows. It knows. My colleagues in the media should take on a leadership role in forming such a movement, particularly those who are television producers, who feed, who bring us the curious mix of news, bombast, and titillation that passes for information in the 24-7 era of cable television. Now, journalists are famous for saying, no, we don't play that kind of role, we don't have a civic duty like that, we're not an educational tool, we're an informational tool. But I think the, the situation today is, is sufficiently dire in terms of public comprehension of what is going on in the world, uh, of the information that's needed to form a coherent and informed opinion on what is going on in the world. We do, we the public at large, know more about more different things instantly than we ever have. Uh, television may not be deep, but it certainly is broad, and compound that square it, cube it for the internet. People now are bombarded and overly stimulated with electronic shards of information that convince them that they have to have an opinion on foreign subjects, on distant places that in the past they were prepared to let elected representatives and our leadership make decisions on without a lot of noise. Uh, the third point I would make is that the question uh, of can the United States have a foreign policy, it, it contained in that question is um, the, the idea, the now familiar idea, or it's becoming more and more familiar, that the U.S. is in a period of decline um, and that the main task of an administration in foreign policy today is to manage that decline. There's truth in that, but I want to put emphasis on the fact that this is a relative phenomenon. It is not only the United States that is seeing its share of GDP uh, reduced. Europe is undergoing the same thing. It is not only the United States that's seeing a gradual disbursement of power across the international scene. We have to view this as a relative phenomenon in which the United States can and should continue to play a major leadership role. Uh, and that the United States manages not so much its own decline, but the decline of the power of the state throughout the world. I think we need to think seriously about why the BRICS and others have cause for concern at least as much as the US over the spreading fragmentation of power. I think that leads me to the conclusion that the United States should be careful in managing the dispersal of power across a variety of international organizations uh, to center much more uh, international involvement in an organization like the G20 rather than to worry about UN Security Council reform. That Security Council reform may be necessary, but it will never be sufficient in the kind of world today that we have. So I think managing the decline of the UN, managing the decline of the G8, uh, the IMF, and other organizations uh, is a principal American task. Um, I'll wind up there just simply by saying this leads me to the conclusion that the United States should devote its 
coherent foreign policy to working for a multilateral system so as to avoid the dangers of a multipolar world. And perhaps we can go into that in Q&A if anybody cares to. Good. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. Very insightful and very comprehensive. Uh, I, I just want to make one comment about the Cold War and the multiplicity of tasks. There was a lot going on in the Cold War that was not uh, the U.S.-Soviet confrontation, much less the military confrontation. At the same time that the Cold War was in full bloom, there was decolonization going on all over the world, creating unbelievable instabilities and dangers. Kenya, Ghana, you name it, decolonization. At the same time, the Japanese and the Koreans were discovering manufacturing. This was going on at the same time as the Cold War was and building up, not noticed too much until, until, well, you know what happened. And then, of course, the other big thing that was happening was the uh, development of the power of the producers of oil, ultimately resulting in OPEC. There were other things going on, too, but, but let's remember there was a wonderful article in the National Interest that outlined a lot of these things that I'm referring to at the current issue of the, of the national interest. So, in any case, we've, we've handled a lot of complications and dispersals of power before, uh, not that they're the same and not that our structure is the same, particularly going back to what Grover said about the structure of the two parties. Uh, I'm sorry to say that, that it seems to me that the two main political parties in this country are more or less brain dead as parties, as national parties. A lot of smart people in the Republican Party, a lot of smart people in the Democratic Party, but as national parties, there's a real problem. All right, I'll shut up. And I'm opening it up now to Q&A, and the rules are that if you want to be recognized, I will recognize you and write your name down on a, on a list, a priority list, and if you want to be recognized, just hold up one finger. If you want to intervene instantly in the discussion, please hold up two, and I'll recognize you out of order. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Please tell us your name. Uh, John Evans, formerly of the State Department. Um, no less an authority than the current uh, um, President of the Council on Foreign Relations once said that inconsistency is the soul of foreign policy. Um, and that would be one possible answer to uh, today's question. Um, I like to think back to the late David Newsom, who was a very distinguished Foreign Service Officer and Undersecretary for Political Affairs, uh, who always began meetings at the State Department that he chaired with a question about the facts. And often as not, there was a briefing from someone in intelligence about what the facts of a particular situation were. Uh, yesterday's panels again and again came back to the uh, philosophy of Richard Nixon and of the Nixon Center, uh, the, the realist approach um, and I would submit, and let me put it in the form of a question, um, isn't what we're groping towards here a recognition that to have a truly realist foreign policy, we have to accept the inevitable inconsistencies that, and incoherences even that exist in the world and respond to them in non-ideological ways? That's, that's my question I, to, to anyone on the panel. Thank you. So your question basically is, in answer to the question of the panel, well, if we had a realistic foreign policy, it might not be coherent, and that's not bad. We got it? What about Grover? Yeah. I think there's a seeming inconsistency. If you take an issue such as the Shah of Iran, uh, 
one might have wished that the Shah of Iran stayed in power rather than fell to Khomeini. But to support the Shah, do you mean you support his, 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 his statist economics, his lack of, of, of any economic liberty in the place, his, his, his being a Shah, not democratically elected? The answer is there are many, many values, um, and sometimes some are going to trump others, and sometimes national interest and in not having somebody who wants to kill you be in charge of a country as opposed to somebody who disappoints you in your list of things that you'd like them to do. Um, I don't think that's inconsistent. It's only inconsistent if one takes all values held collectively by Americans and ranks them all at all times exactly the same ranking, and then you go, well, but you're focused on this and not that. That's inconsistent. It, it's, I think it, it may seem inconsistent, but I don't think that you want a foolish consistency. Um, sometimes certain issues, values, are more important today. And some countries that fail you in column B, as long as they're with you on column C, you can get back to column B and fix it. Okay? Um, and if they're not with you on C, you never get back to B. So there's, there's a hierarchy that moves around. And, and yes, some people will call that inconsistent, but I'm not sure it is if you're consistent in your overall goals. Yeah, I'd like to add something to that. Uh, I'm, I'm reading the question as uh, suggesting that uh, there ought to be a certain amount of flexibility in any foreign policy to uh, respond and adjust to the uh, mishmash of uh, forces and pressures that exist in the world. And I would agree with that entirely. Um, I think that the important part about establishing a foreign policy that can be successful, however, I think it's got to have a certain amount of coherence at its base. And by that I mean that the fundamental challenge is to determine, first of all, what is in the American national interest, and then what are the pressures and forces and swirling um, uh, eels uh, um, in the vast cauldron of the globe that are um, either helping uh, promote those or thwarting those or threatening those. Um, and there's always a great deal of capacity since we're all human beings for folly in that, and we know a lot of history that would indicate that there has been. Um, but that is the fundamental challenge, and it seems to me that there needs to be a certain amount of consistency in understanding that, and also a certain consistent um, um, judgment to be brought to bear in assessing uh, the global challenges that then impress themselves upon that. Uh, John, I think your question implies that uh, foreign policy should be a case-by-case -case, uh, enterprise, um, and, and there's certainly an argument for that. I, I, would, I would cast it, though, as uh, you need certainly to recognize that there are exceptions to the principles that you lay out. Uh, NATO is going through the exercise now of coming up with strategic concept. What value does such a document uh, or the NPR, that we, the uh, nuclear posture review that we just went through? Primarily, these are declaratory policies that serve to put adversaries on notice of where our red lines are, but also inform the bureaucracy, our own people, our own military and diplomats, um, of what it is the United States stands for and wants to accomplish. So I think they, you do need the principles, you do need them codified and spelled out uh, while making room for exceptions. Yes, that's true, and uh, yes, sir, you, yes, you. <laughs> um, Stanley Cover with the Cato Institute. Um, in the social contract, Jean-Jacques Rousseau address this question. He contrasted the general will with the will of all. The general will represents the national interest. The will of all is all the parochial interests added up. How do you reconcile the general will with the will of all? He advocated democracy, but with a caveat. You have a lawgiver who stands apart and above the will of all to bring it into line with the general will. It seems to me we have a model of such a country now. It's called Iran. The supreme leader is Rousseau's lawgiver. So you have a mirage of democracy, but ultimately the power rests with the supreme leader. 
from the law journal. I remember being a student in the Soviet Union. And the Soviets said, we do not allow this democracy to affect our decision making. It will just confuse us. So we make our decisions in secret. That's the idea of the national interest over the parochial interest. We saw how well that worked. So my question is, can you know the national interest? In the Federalist Papers, Madison rejected the Rousseau and model, basically saying, everybody can say they know what the national interest is. How do you know? So the best we can do is practice in practice, prevent the totalitarian system, is to simply aggregate the parochial interest up. It's bottom up. That's democracy. Institutionally, how else can we do it? Thank you. Any comments from the panel? Response? Well, it does bring to mind Winston Churchill's famous definition of least worst. Least worst. Uh, I'm going to take a stab at that. Um, I, I um, it's, it's sort of my reading of American history <clears throat> that throughout most of our history, it is true that the definition of a national interest uh, emerged from among the polity and bubbled up to the leaders of the country. But largely in terms of foreign policy, the American people were content most of the time to delegate that to the elites that I was describing before. Uh, and it was a, a certain amount of uh, indirection that was allowed in our polity on foreign policy that was never even contemplated by the American people collectively in terms of uh, domestic policy, particularly economic policy, because that was bread and butter. I think that, uh, in my own view, and I guess you could get this from my early remarks, that that has been uh, that's something that has been eroded significantly in recent years, and that raises fundamental questions. Um, I'm not, is not necessarily raising a value judgment about those trends, uh, but it is a reality that I think is affecting foreign policy making. The, I had mentioned how the structures of the two parties give the president a fair amount of leeway because around the table, the 12 issue clusters that he has to deal with, because if he crosses one, he doesn't get reelected. Um, foreign policy is generally not at the table there. Um, so the president can do a lot of things, but he loses the ability to do that if um, the war in Vietnam goes on too long or the uh, involvement in Iraq goes on too long. And then you have every two or four years people going, now wait a minute, we hadn't, we hadn't signed up for this. Um, people agreed with, the polls say, with Bush's decision to uh, take out Saddam Hussein's regime, but they hadn't signed on evidently to staying for a great period of time and trying to turn it into Kansas. And elections were lost uh, at, as a result. So that there's a lot of freedom in the short term. I mean, unless you're dealing with Armenia, Greece, Cuba, or Israel, and then you're a little more constrained. But any place else you could generally shell or ignore, uh, and it, it won't cost you the next election. Unless you screw it up. And it goes on too long. You can screw things up if they don't go on too long. You go into Lebanon, they, they, uh, as Reagan did, you leave, no harm, no foul. If he'd stayed and managed the Lebanese civil war um, for the next 15 years, then people might have been unhappy. Dr. Schlesinger? We sometimes exaggerate the authority of authority more from the Republican center-right side than, than on the Democratic side. George Herbert Walker Bush was elected, as just said, because he wasn't going to do any of that silly nation-building stuff. And we weren't going to be off chasing butterflies in Somalia and stuff. And we were going to have a humbler foreign policy. And then he got into office and psh, went just the opposite way. And everybody in the party saluted. And the country goes, OK. Uh, that's an awful lot of running room available that is not available if, the, if somebody decided to change their mind on tax policy, gun control, social security, make a list of domestic issues. The country would not have gone, okay, we'll, we, we'll do it that way. We elect you on one thing and we'll all do something else. Uh, and again, the election of Rand Paul yesterday suggests that that wasn't a permanent shift in Republican thinking. 
Uh, and when Cheney tried to argue that it was two and you can't elect this guy statewide because he doesn't buy into my thesis, people said, no, we're not permanently bought into your thesis on how this, how this foreign policy ought to be run. So if we can get a coherent foreign policy, there's a lot of ability to share one, develop one, and implement one because the, the, there aren't pillars out there getting in the way uh, that said, no, you can't do this. Good. Dimitri? <coughs> I think it's pretty clear that we're not going to get congressional leadership from coherent foreign policy. I don't know whether Ambassador Elsort would be offended by that, but my impression is that the Congress was never meant and is inherently incapable of developing the coherent foreign policy. But the question is about presidential leadership. And I want to interpret Grover what you said, because I, I think that you made two important statements. You said that essentially most Americans and most Republicans don't particularly care about foreign policy. That George Bush could go into Iraq, but also had an option of not going into Iraq, and uh, the party still would be with him. If that is the case, uh, how much difference a real presidential leadership can make? Particularly if you are talking about the past year, when the president still has a honeymoon, when he still can use political capital. So my question is very simple. Does strong presidential leadership can make a fundamental difference, only a difference at the margin? I think it can make a tremendous uh, difference because when the president stakes out a position, his own party is going to support him. The only question is his relative strength versus the other party for things that need congressional approval. Um, but we've had an executive branch over the last 20 years trying to limit the number of things for which they need congressional approval down to things on one hand. Uh, so they've accumulated a lot of de facto power, but I think they also have the freedom to make those decisions. Uh, now, the, the Democrats, uh, Obama didn't come in and make some of the changes that his supporters, some of his supporters thought he would on Iraq and, and other foreign policy issues, because the Democrats are still living with this fear that when they do something insufficiently aggressive or strong, that they'll be called weak by the Republicans. They're living under the cloud of, some would say, having been on the wrong side of the Cold War for 40 years uh, uh, in terms of some of the left-wing intellectuals. and. Um, so they're hesitant to do that. With the Bush administration reducing the value of Republican capital on we're the party that knows what to do on foreign policy, that gives the Democrats more running room than they had. Thank you. Justine? Well, noise becomes a factor in itself when it's loud enough, um, and I fear that we, we are reaching that point. Uh, what's happened on, on the media landscape, as it has on the international um, governance landscape, is the fragmentation. Uh, we now have niche markets for certain points of view stated in certain ways. Uh, that's led to the widely commented upon phenomenon of um, people seeking out only sources of information that confirm what they already think, um, which to my way of thinking is both dangerous and no fun at all. Uh, in, trying to, in writing a column, one of the things I try to do is to address people who have an open mind on a situation and to try to suggest ways to think about it, how to think about it, rather than what to think. Um, so, uh, you, my, my answer is naturally, th this is a major problem. The media itself um, has to begin to accept the kind of responsibility that it's required here um, and look at the national interest uh, as well as the commercial interest of the day. 
Thank you. Yes, sir. I, I, I'd like to just add something to that, if I could. Uh, I, I agree with Jim, and I, I think that, that uh, what's happening in the media is playing into the particularist trends that I was describing earlier. But I, I'd like to say something about Dimitri's point, if I could, very, very briefly. Um, I, I believe that, in, especially in today's time, when we have a, a little bit of a, a sense of, of, of incoherence or not quite sure where we're going, uh, the, I think that the opportunity for a strong president is extremely uh, significant and big. Um, I think that in times of actual coherent foreign policy, let's take the Cold War, I think that that may be a little bit more curtailed and restrained. And I'll give you an example, Vietnam. Um, a lot of people believe that Vietnam was like this t total aberration, like uh, the president stepped out of, of uh, wisdom and judgment to uh, get us into Vietnam. But uh, a study of the Cold War would indicate that the Vietnam uh, adventure was very much part and parcel of the fundamental philosophy that had been guiding American foreign policy since the beginning of the Cold War. And you don't have to go back to Johnson's agonizing uh, phone calls and uh, conversations uh, to see how he, he saw this trap that he was getting into but felt that politically he had no choice. Uh, so uh, it really depends on the circumstances. In our circumstances, I think that the, uh, the circumstances are really calling for a strong leader who would have a lot of leeway. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, you, you look at the results yesterday, for example, of the strong anti-incumbent tide that we're seeing um, here. Um, so, so I do. Yes, sir. Uh, let me ask this question. What's the relation between the government being involved in this and trade and international banking in the world, and how does that how does that affect it, or does it affect our our, our, our whole thing? Is I'm sorry. Is the question to to what extent is the power of international financial institutions curtailing the power of governmental officials to affect in, in what in trade? Well, if you, if, it's an interesting question because if you look back to uh, just before uh, the election of George W. Bush and September 11th, the widespread theory of international relations at that point was that international corporations will become more important. Multinationals will become more important than nation states. Um, and we will not really need armies to occupy territory. It's, uh, and September 11th changed that to a great extent. The recurrent financial crisis that we've gone through have also changed that, and uh, at least momentarily strengthened the grip of the nation state uh, on resources. Certainly, you look at the spending, the stimulus spending, TARP, and all of that, and the great uh, defense buildup um, that we've had. Um, so the, the, the trend right now has, has been other than what we assumed 10 years ago, um, that it would lead to increasing uh, multinational activity outside the control of government, and at the same time force governments to devote all their time and a lot of their energy to NAFTA, to a free trade agreement between the European Union and the United States. Um, to open up borders, borders would become much more porous. Uh, the question is, is this a trend that's going to continue, the, the, the stopping of this, or, or the per, parenthesis, is this a parenthesis or is this the continuation? Um, certainly we've seen today that the nation state still has a great role in regulating trade and commerce and borders. Uh, but ultimately, governments have to pay a lot more attention than they did in the past to those factors. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Mary, one of the things I remember Henry Kissinger said was that uh, when he was Secretary of State was that anyone going into a senior policy position in Washington 
will go through that job with the intellectual capital they bring to it because nobody's going to have time to learn anything uh, on the job. And having seen a couple of very prominent and extraordinarily intelligent cabinet members uh, fairly close up, the thing that always astonished me is how little time they had in their day to do much of anything. I mean, I used to get tired just looking at Bill Perry's schedule in the morning, let alone trying to, to, to emulate it. Uh, I think the, the issue of the sheer human frailty that policymakers have always had to deal with has become compounded with the amount of demands on their time for congressional testimony and media appearances and, and all the kind, you know, and the whole interagency process, which is incredibly time consuming. Uh, and once you keep in mind that people only have, you know, there's only 24 hours in the day for these people, and that throughout our, our history, even our most talented presidents have made policy often based on just prejudices that they brought with them from childhood. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt and Theodore Roosevelt being classic cases of people who made momentous policy decisions based on notions that they had picked up from, in Franklin Roosevelt's case, his mother, and Theodore Roosevelt's case, uh, his, his racial ideas. We had a reference earlier to James Madison. I noticed we have Madison looking down the, off the, from a, on the wall at us. And Madison, who I'd argue is probably one of the brightest bulbs of the founding fathers, as president conducted policies which were the antithesis of what he would have argued for when he was in Congress or when he was at the Constitutional Convention and got us into what I would argue is the most foolish war in our history. If he couldn't get coherence from James Madison, I wouldn't be too hopeful that we're going to get it from anybody nowadays. I think you raise a point, the importance of... of uh uh, of the Nixon Center in that you're at, not only do these presidents, cabinet officers, congressmen, senators live their um, professional lives like a long Seinfeld episode with no learning taking place. Um, they even go beyond that to, to, to childhood. When I was 21, I actually came to a decision that nobody learns anything about politics after the age of 21. I still hold that view. Um, people get a fixed idea and then they go and deal with the day. But and the, the framework they're dealing with is from a long time ago. It's not just the day before they got elected. It's not like they were reading books until the day they got elected and then they stopped reading, um, reading books. So groups like the Nixon Center briefing <coughs> governors, congressmen, senators, staffers, people, and, and particularly the, the younger, earlier guys who still are learning, uh, is terribly important. Yes, sir. Uh, Jim Collins from Carnegie Endowment. Uh, I would like to suggest that there are three major impediments to having a coherent foreign policy right now. And that it's not very likely we're going to get beyond them anytime soon. And then I'd like to have your comments. First is, the world isn't providing us an organizing principle. Now, for most of the 20th century, or most of the modern era in which the United States was an international player, others were providing us with the organizing principle, whether it was the imperial period, the Nazi period, or the communist. We were fundamentally organizers and marshals and resources to achieve a competition in that isn't here right now. We have a very messy and disorganized world in which it's not clear we have much of a, of a serious major in it that will organize it. Second reason I think it's very difficult is that we're organized to deal with the past uh, problems in our bureaucracies, our budgets, our, the way we are structured to deal with foreign policy. I mean, if you look, where does the money go? Follow the money. It's essentially not foreign policy. It's national security policy. And it is directed at particular specific kinds of dangers that the American people want, I think, addressed. I'm not arguing they don't. But if you look at the defense budget and the others, compared to other things like how we are dealing with some of the other challenges, it's a real problem whether we're organized. And the third problem is, I think, it, that the American people have no sense that foreign policy is relevant to them. Or more importantly, that at least current foreign policy establishments are dealing with their problems. 
immigration, narcotics, organized crime, the things that affect life in communities. Ask yourself how much effect our foreign policy, diplomacy, and structures of that kind today are really affecting the outcomes of those issues which have an effect. And I would finally just conclude with one point. I think the other thing that's very instructive about the last 10, 20 years is that foreign policy became relevant when it became domestic. And the most significant way an issue that became domestic, in my judgment, was the Iraq War. When you had you know, 100,000 young men over there and daily you were seeing some get killed, that was a domestic issue. But you know, climate change, other things, it's tough to make the case. So I'd just like to suggest, I mean, I'd like your comments to whether you think it's possible to have a coherent foreign policy when we don't have any consensus. Can I, can I make two comments, or, or one comment and one question, and by the way, Thank you for that very clear and sort of coherent, if I may say so, <laughs> intervention. Uh, first of all, the question of 100,000 soldiers in Iraq at one time. Remember, we don't have a draft in this country. And the, the elimination of the draft, the military draft in this country, was for the specific purpose of giving the president the flexibility to have a coherent foreign policy as he wanted to at the moment. So if we'd had a draft in this country, it would have been a different meeting today and a different several years of discussion. Secondly, nobody has mentioned, and I would like to open the first the panel here to comment on this, China. How should we think about China? What should we think about China? Jim Hogan, can you tell us? What, how, but I mean, the question is how to think about China. This is a whole new phenomenon, I think. Hmm. Please. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I totally agree with you there. Oh, okay. uh, because, um, well, I, let me deal with uh, Ambassador Collins' points first. Uh, I certainly agree that uh, there is no clear organizing principle in this, this messy world. Um, there is no long telegram that is going to provide us with the kind of strategy that we pursued throughout the Cold War, but perhaps the measure of coherence will become the extent to which the different parts of a foreign policy fit together. And I think that is uh, something that can be done and, and, and this administration is striving for as it deals with increasingly global problems, and that's my answer to your question, Bob, uh, is to view China uh, in a global context. And uh, that is why I mentioned in, in my opening remarks that I think uh, you should realize that the BRICS are not going to rule the world. Uh, developments don't stay marching in a straight line. China is a little more than a decade away from facing a serious demographic problem as the effects of the one-child policy come into play and you see an aging population uh, that is going to depend on a shrinking workforce. Uh, and you see already, I think, a lot of social protests going on, not necessarily around that issue, but related issues. Um, I'm not suggesting that China has to be seen as a giant with clay feet. But I am suggesting that we need to see it in the context of the relative dispersal of power, even though there is this period they're going through where China is clearly accumulating power, uh, is building up its military. Um, but um, that doesn't mean that the line is going to continue straight forward. Uh, Mary, how should we be thinking about China? Well, I think we should be thinking about China in the same way that we should be thinking about um, our overall role in the world. I think that China represents one of the biggest future challenges that we are going to face, although I also think that it's possible that we're going to find out uh, that China is a paper tiger economically and it's going to, uh, not, it's going to uh, fade uh, rather significantly. But I don't think we can count on that. 
And so uh, my view is that we should be dealing with uh, East Asia in the same way that we should be dealing with other major regions, which is to make sure that we project ourselves and, and uh, on our power uh, to the best that we can, recognizing that there are regional interests and, um, and uh, regional um, imperatives on the part of our, our adversaries and allies or adversaries slash allies, and those have to be taken into account in our foreign policy. Uh, whether that can work uh, with regard to China long term, if China is not the paper tiger that I suspect, uh, is a very much of an open question, it seems to me. Robert, how are you thinking about China? I share the sense that China has demographic problems. A lot of their growth comes from adding to the number of people that they've brought from the countryside into to working. And you can't keep doing that because they've brought in quite a number of people and they've stopped having as many kids and particularly women as they need to. But I think we should deal with China as we deal with other countries, trade with them, engage them, stay strong enough to defend ourselves against anyone who throws a punch at us. And when we have problems or enemies in the world, isolate them rather than accumulate them together to try and create something big enough to replicate the Soviet Union, which seems to be sometimes what the guys who wish for the good old days, any opponent either needs to be Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, and if it's too small to make it that, they add things to it to imagine a bigger and bigger problem. So you want to isolate your enemies when Richard Nixon helped to accent the separation between China and the Soviet Union, he made us stronger in the world. He didn't run around saying, all communists are the same and we, we're going to fight them all as a team. They divided. He recognized that division. Divide your enemies, isolate them, trade with everybody, engage with everybody, and be strong enough to stop a punch. Ladies and gentlemen, our time is up. It's 1030, and I want to ask you to give a little round of recognition to our brilliant <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.